Now, for those of you who've been watching this channel for some time, you'll know that I enjoy classic American vehicles, but there are some Japanese vehicles in particular of the 1980s that I must admit I'm especially fond of. During this period in American automotive history, the domestics were churning out some vehicles that, let's just say, had some issues. And it's really no wonder why some people went to other makes to try something different. Imagine, for instance, you had traded in your silky smooth 60s or early 70s era domestic vehicle for something that was much more compact and powered by a harsh sounding four cylinder engine and paid a lot more for it in the 1980s. You probably would start to shop around as well. Well, one of the vehicles that was produced in the 1980s I believe just has an awesome interior and it's an overall it's a really cool vehicle and that is the 1985 and 1986 Toyota Cressida. Recall during this time period this is before Lexus was launched from Toyota so they really didn't have that brand as their range topper. And the Cressida served to fill that gap at the top of Toyota's lineup for somebody who is looking for something more luxurious than a typical Camry or Corolla and also larger. Now the Cressida was also a very special vehicle in many ways and that's because it's basically a four-door Toyota Supra including having its 2.8 liter inline six-cylinder engine lifted from the vehicle. It didn't make all that much power, but for the time, it made around 160 horsepower, and frankly, that was quite a bit. And it did it with a wonderful silky smoothness and beautiful noise that nobody could really find fault with. The car also had pretty conventional American-style styling for the time period, and let's just say that it was conservative looking. There's really nothing offensive about the Cressida, aside from perhaps the bumper offsets, which look cartoonish today especially the rear bumper, but the overall vehicle was somewhat confused in terms of how Toyota tried to market it. It wasn't clear if it was supposed to be a sporty car or a luxury car, a Japanese car, an American car, a European car. It had elements of really all of the best of those vehicles, some of which included four-wheel independent suspension, rear-wheel drive. Yes, this car was rear-wheel drive, I mentioned the previously the 2.8 liter 5M six cylinder engine under hood that was rated around 160 horsepower depending upon the year. And just an overall wonderful level of smoothness and refinement. Interior refinement on these was very high. And if you were traveling at about 65 miles per hour, you only had about 65 decibels of audible noise inside, which is pretty close to Lexus-like quiet even today. The car also featured four-wheel disc brakes, but it did have kind of a soft and mushy suspension. So you have this interesting combination of very sporty pieces of technology and frankly expensive pieces like the four-wheel independent suspension and four-wheel disc brakes inline six-cylinder engine, four-speed automatic, and the sporting buyer could even get a five-speed manual transmission in the Cressida in some years. And all those pieces combined together to form a rather interesting vehicle that, as I mentioned, was somewhat confused from an overall equipment and styling standpoint on the outside. Now, why did I pick the 1985 and 1986 Cressida? The Cressida existed before and it existed after 1986 as well. But there's something about the 1985 and 1986 models that, for my mind, is really just special in terms of the overall Cressida lineup. Part of it is that it still has this conservative exterior styling, and the Toyota was kind of dipping their toe into some American elements, if you will. In 1986, the Cressida got a stand-up hood ornament that was the only year that it had that, and it was gone again in 1987. It's almost like Toyota said, boy, how can we be more Cadillac with this vehicle and added the hood ornament and then later took it away very abruptly. But it's really the interiors of the 1985 and 1986 Cressida that I think are just quite special. And they're so American in so many ways. And yet they are still confused and the interior has a bit of a confusing personality just like the exterior does. So let's turn now from talking about the conservatively styled architectural Cressida exterior and look at the interior and see why I believe that this is one of the most American style interiors in some ways of any car that was ever produced. 
And to that end, this interior shot should say it all. Take a look at these wonderful velour button tufted seats. These were available on the Cressida in 1985 and 1986. In 1987, they did have some button tufted seats, but they revised the pattern. And to me, these 1985 and six interiors really are the top when it comes to emulating American design. Now there are some clearly European elements to these seats and you'll note there is some side bolstering which was really not typical for any domestic vehicle during that time period or before. And these Cressida seats also have lots of different adjustments from the backrest angle which by the way was for some reason just not offered on many domestic vehicles until the 1980s at best. Aside from AMC who tended to put that backrest adjustment in a number of its vehicles relatively early compared to GM, Ford, and Chrysler. But you could also move the seat in many different directions as opposed to just fore and aft in the backrest angle. You could rotate it up and down with various controls that were on the side of the seat. But I think that this Cressida seat pattern somewhat mimics some 1970s era Pontiac interior patterns with this diamond button tufting that you can see here found on the Pontiac Granvilles in the early 1970s, an interior that was designed by Blaine Jenkins, who also did the 1972 Oldsmobile 98 Regency interior, which of course had a bunch of button tufting all over it as well. And here's a picture of the myriad seat adjustments. You can see two rotating knobs. You can't see the lever that you'd pull to adjust the backrest, which is just behind that second knob. But again, a lot of American style elements, this interior, including the seat stitch pattern, as well as the velour fabric and the deep pile carpeting, which certainly was an American trait for sure. However, there are a number of what I'll call confused design elements to this interior. First of which are those seat belts, which some of us will remember from the 1980s. This was during a time period when automakers had to have some form of passive restraint that would keep occupants in the seat even if they didn't buckle their seat belt and would help protect them in crashes. So the automatic seat belt was one way of solving that requirement. General Motors had their infamous door-mounted seat belts. You, of course, could have an airbag, but that was thought to be too costly on many vehicles. So that's one strange element. Another strange element is the dash on this vehicle is actually very Japanese in a number of ways, and it does have some innovative features. Take a look at this photo from a 1985 Cressida, and you see the typical American two-spoke steering wheel as opposed to the more European three-spoke wheel. So that's the first giveaway that they're trying to emulate some American vehicles. Of course, this vehicle does have the optional digital dash, which has the tachometer that's horizontally oriented. And this was a unique element. Most American cars, although you could get digital dashes in Cadillacs in particular with digital speed readouts, they didn't offer a tachometer. So that was something that was uniquely Toyota during this period. And Japanese in general for these types of sedans. You could get similar digital dashes in other Japanese vehicles, but not domestic vehicles that typically had such a large tack at least. Off to the left is a pod with what really has the mirror control. You can adjust the mirrors left, right, up, and down. And then in some of the vehicles, they have heated mirrors as well. That was a rarity during this time period, but one of those buttons is actually to make the mirror heat turn on. And I think another most interesting thing is that right pod. This was a novel idea that Toyota had, similar to what some other automakers were doing, but they put a lot of the radio controls in that pod up at the top there so you didn't have to reach all the way down to change the radio volume or to go to a different station. You could just do quite a few things from that little pod up at the top there. It was a nice idea. It didn't have to move your hand very far off the steering wheel and it worked effectively. You do notice that this radio, though, is a very, very Japanese-style radio with these multi-band equalizers. Of course, you could get multi-band equalizers in American cars, but not that many 
equalizing elements that you could change often. It was often just a five-band equalizer. The car also, if you notice, underneath the steering wheel has the air conditioning cooler vent, the so-called crotch cooler vent down there, a very American feature, wanted to make you feel at home if you had bought a 1970s domestic luxury car. You would, however, struggle with the controls on these vehicles. You notice that on the right is the wiper stalk, and on the left is the turn signal and the bright light indicator. So there was no foot pedal for the bright lights. You had to pull the turn signal, and the wiper was on its own different stalk. A very different approach from what General Motors was doing, which was integrating all of these things into one stock on the left-hand side of the steering column. And another great thing about the Crested was that you could get this interior in different colors. Here you can see it in a red color, just an overall stunning color. This car is missing its uh, steering column, so a few issues associated with it, but it's tough to find pictures of these Crested is in nice shape. One other thing I'll call out that was very Japanese during the time period is the gear shift on these automatic transmission shifters. And there's a button on the shifter itself that was to turn the overdrive on and off. And then there was also a button just to the side of the Perndle indicator, which would enable you to change the shift points on the transmission by selecting a power or normal mode for shifting. So it did have some sporty elements. That was something that Saturn later copied for GM, that performance and normal set up on the transmission shifts, as well as the Oldsmobile Aurora. I don't think many other domestic vehicles copied that, but it was kind of cool. Overall, I think the 1985 and 1986 Crested interior was just a cool mix of various American elements, and it was put together in a really, really nice package, one which combined some of the best of American elements with other multinational elements, and I think the car was just a compelling vehicle. And frankly, I'd like to own one today, but for the fact that it's really tough to find somebody to service these vintage Japanese vehicles now and to get parts. In any case, hope you enjoyed this spotlight on the 1985 and 1986 Cressida. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and let me know what you think is one of the most interesting interiors on a vehicle. Thanks again for watching.